Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, so basically I'm revising what we did in the first lecture. This is uh, Fix's first law of diffusion. Um, I'm just pointing out that you should be consistent in the units that you use. If the flux is in atoms per meter squared per second, then the concentration should also be in atoms per meter cubed. And the units of diffusion coefficient then can be derived as meter squared per second. Okay? So that's Fix's first law of diffusion. <coughs> And it applies to scenarios where we have steady state fluxes. That means there's diffusion going on, okay? But you don't actually see any change in the concentration profile inside the region where diffusion is happening. So th this is a typical scenario where you have a, a gas cylinder, say, containing uh, atomic hydrogen, okay? Now, the, there's a certain pressure inside the gas cylinder and Outside, you can assume that the pressure is zero for hydrogen. And because this is a thin wall, it's diffusing uh, at a constant rate. There's a constant flux, and the gradient remains the same. And if you were an observer located at this point, you would see no change happening, even though diffusion is occurring. Okay? So this only applies to scenarios where you have steady state diffusion. And by contrast, uh, this is an example, a very important industrial example. Uh, this is a particular gear, and as you know, gears mesh with each other, and they rub against each other, and there are huge contact stresses. So there are different requirements for the core of this gear. The core of the gear has to be able to support stresses and sudden knocks, etc. Say you put your gear lever into the wrong place without using the clutch, then this has to be extremely tough. It's got to be able to take an impact. On the other hand, here, we want wear resistance. It's got to be extremely hard. So what we do is we diffuse carbon into the surface by maintaining a constant carbon potential using a, a gas mixture on the outside, heating it up so that diffusion can be rapid, and allowing carbon to diffuse into the surface, and that hardens the surface. Okay, so this is called carburization. Uh, the concentration at the surface is maintained constant. So here we have our error function solution. You remember that the concentration remains constant at the surface, and you can work out the depth of penetration of the carbon using an equation like this. The boundary conditions simply are that you're maintaining a constant concentration at the surface, and the concentration far away from the surface is the average carbon concentration of the steel before you start to carburize it. Okay. And there are many, many cases like this, uh, uh, not just for gears, but for many components where you are diffusing things into the surface to change the surface properties. Now, I talked about the Kirkendall effect in the last lecture, where one species of atoms diffuses at a faster rate than the other species. So the diffusion coefficient of A atoms is larger than that of the B atoms. That is known as, uh, when, when I talk about the diffusion coefficient of a particular species, what I mean is an intrinsic diffusion coefficient. So we are just looking at that particular species. But of course, if you have a mixture of A and B, if A diffuses, then the concentration of B must also change, right? Therefore, uh, we use another diffusion coefficient, which is called the interdiffusion coefficient. Again, this is in your in your notes, but I'll write it down quickly, that the interdiffusion coefficient, which describes both the flux of A and B and of any vacancies, is the concentration of A times the diffusion, intrinsic diffusion coefficient of B plus the concentration of B times the intrinsic diffusion coefficient of A. So we call this the intrinsic diffusion coefficient. And this is the interdiffusion coefficient. Okay. So it's quite, quite simple. Uh, with the interdiffusion coefficient, we are taking account of everything happening, A atoms diffusing, B atoms diffusing, and vacancies moving about. I'm going to now move on to structure-sensitive diffusion, because everything I've said 
deals with diffusion in a perfect crystal, albeit we have some vacancies, but the vacancies are there as equilibrium defects. Okay. But supposing we have other defects, can you imagine what sort of defects we might have in a crystal? Any ideas? Line defects such as dislocations. How about surface defects? What kind of surface defects do we have? Yeah, say in a polycrystalline material. Grain boundaries. And these defects have a larger volume per atom than the main perfect crystal. So it's going to be much easier for atoms to diffuse through the defects than through the perfect crystal. Then I will go on to discuss the thermodynamics of diffusion and show you circumstances in which diffusion can happen up a concentration gradient. Okay, so this is an illustration of um, structure-sensitive diffusion. So this is actually a grain boundary, and this image is taken using a technique which highlights the solute atoms, and you can see that they've penetrated a very large distance along the grain boundary, but not substantially into the adjacent regions of more or less perfect crystal. Okay, so that's an easy diffusion path. And here is an example where uh, an aluminum silicon rod was put into a pure aluminum matrix. And these are the grain boundaries that you see. And once diffusion was carried out, you can see that solute is basically moving along the grain boundaries, because those are regions with large free volume. So you might argue that you know, we don't need to worry about diffusion through the lattice because the, the easiest diffusion path is the grain boundary. Okay? However, notice that the vast majority of atoms in this picture are not located at the grain boundaries. They are located in the perfect, uh, perfect regions of the crystal. So although diffusion is much easier along a boundary, the fraction of material that is occupied by the boundary is much smaller than the fraction occupied by the perfect crystal. So we, we've really got to look at the fluxes through bro, both of those regions and see how that influences the diffusion coefficient. So let's imagine uh, an idealized uh, and very approximate model of a grain in a polycrystalline material. I've never seen grains of this shape, okay? but for the sake of calculation, we'll assume that the grains are of this shape. So the grain is circular. It has a radius r, and the thickness of the boundary is delta. Okay? And typically, delta will be no more than a couple of atoms in thickness, because a grain boundary is a very, very narrow region of misfit between two crystals. And we are looking at flux going through the plane of the board. Okay? Now, the fraction of material which is located at the grain boundary as opposed to the perfect region is simply given by the ratio of the two areas, and that comes out as 2 delta over the diameter of the grain. Very simple calculation. I'm just calculating the area of that ring divided by the total area of the grain. Okay, so that's 2 delta over the diameter of the grain boundary. If we look at the flux going through the plane of the board, then there will be a flux going through the perfect region of the crystal, which I've identified by the subscript P, and a flux going through the grain boundary identified by the subscript GB. And we've got to scale these fluxes according to their areas. And that's why we have this term here, which is multiplying by this flux. I should really have 1 minus 2 delta over D on this side. But in most circumstances, that's so close to 1 that we can ignore that term. Okay? If we go to nanocrystalline metals, of course, that is no longer the case and you need a term here which is 1 minus 2 delta upon d. And when you do that, you find that the actual diffusion coefficient will depend on the diffusion through the perfect lattice and also through the grain boundary according to the amount of grain boundary you have in your material. Okay? Now, supposing that you have a very, very large crystal size, then this term will be negligible. Okay? OK, so that deals with structure-sensitive diffusion. We've derived a diffusion coefficient, which uh, is a function of the grain size. In this case, the defect is the grain surface. We could have done a similar calculation for 
pipe diffusion along dislocations. And we can represent that diffusion coefficient as a function of temperature in the normal way. Logarithm of d versus 1 upon t will no longer actually give you a straight line because these two diffusion coefficients have different dependence on temperature. Okay, so if I plot the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient versus 1 upon t, it's 1 upon t. So over here, I have a low temperature, low temperature and a high temperature. And this is the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient. Then this is the plot for the perfect lattice. Okay. If I now have a grain boundaries in my material, then at very high temperatures, the difference between the grain boundary diffusion coefficient and the perfect lattice is small. So the curve will follow this one. Okay. But then, if I go to low temperatures, the diffusion coefficient in the perfect lattice becomes very, very small because things vary with exponential of the activation energy over kT. And so this is the imperfect lattice. lattice. So it, it will no longer be a straight line because in this region, grain boundary diffusion dominates. But in this region, the two diffusion coefficients are not very different, and the number of sites in the perfect lattice is much la larger than in the grain boundaries. Everyone happy with that? OK, so now I'm going to change the topic and move on to the thermodynamics of diffusion. And once again, I'm going to revise some of the material that you did at part 1a. I pointed out to you that Fix's laws are empirical. You know, we have a basic assumption that the flux is proportional to the concentration gradient. And that doesn't make sense because, really, it's free energy gradients that determine processes. When a system is allowed to reach equilibrium, it stops uh, changing once the free energy is uniform everywhere. Okay? So we should really be thinking about a flux being proportional to the free energy gradient of a solute. And then the question arises, you know, how do you define the free energy of a particular solute in a solution? Okay, so what we want is the free energy of A atoms in a solution which consists of A and B atoms. How do, how do we define that? Okay, so let's imagine we have a binary AB solution in which A is the solute. That means A has a small concentration compared with B. Okay? So B can be a solute if A has a larger concentration than B. And I haven't defined this as yet, but let's say that this represents the molar free energy of, an a, of a atoms, a mole of A atoms in a solution, AB solution. Okay? So I'll, I'll explain the physical meaning of this term shortly. But that's the definition that I'm putting, that mu A is the molar free energy of A atoms in a solution of A and B. And as usual, the concentration is with capital C. So this is the concentration of A atoms. And if I multiply the concentration by the molar free energy, then I actually get the free energy of A atoms. Yeah? Because mu depends on the number of moles we have. So if I multiply by the concentration, then I get the free energy of the A atoms in an AB solution. Okay? So this is all, all linear nodes. OK, now let's try and uh, work out what this term should be. Now, we have Fix's first law in which J, the, diff uh, the diffusion flux, is equal to minus D times the concentration gradient. I want to rewrite that as the flux of A now depends on the gradient of free energy of the A atoms. And this, if you remember, concentration times that simply gives me the free energy of the A atoms. Okay? And instead of the diffusion coefficient, I now have a term M, which is known as the mobility of the A atoms. Okay? It, it's different from a diffusion coefficient because we don't have a concentration gradient here anymore. If I compare this equation 
with Fix's first law, then by analogy, I could define the diffusion coefficient as this term here, the concentration times the mobility times the way in which the chemical, uh, in which this term mu varies with the concentration of A. Okay. So there's a very simple calculation there that all I've done is I've written d mu A by dx as is equal to dc A, uh, sorry, is equal to d mu A by dc A times dc A by dx. Okay, so this, this is the gradient of concentration in Fix's first law, and I've replaced this here by this term here. Okay, so it's straightforward substitution. And what this tells me is that the diffusion coefficient is concentration dependent. Okay, first of all, we've got this concentration term here. So it will change depending on the nature of your solution. And furthermore, we have this term here, which we have to explore as yet, which is the free energy of A atoms in that solution. And that may also vary with concentration. Okay? So this is why, you know, when you see a diffusion coefficient quoted in a simple textbook, you know, it's not likely to be generally applicable. It will, in general, vary with the concentration. Okay. And this M is known as the Einstein mobility of atoms. So let's look more carefully at how we can take the free energy of a solution and divide it into a part which belongs to the A atoms and a part which belongs to the B atoms. Okay. So here, um, X refers to the concentration of the B atoms. Okay, so it's the mole fraction of B atoms. So in this equation, where I have G alpha, where alpha is a solid solution, I've got 1 minus X into that plus X into that. This is the concentration of A atoms. And here is that of the B atoms. atoms. So all I'm saying is that, look, I've got the total free energy here. And mu A and mu B are defined such that I can separate out the effects of A and B. Okay, I've still got to justify this equation. Yeah, there are no terms over here which are dependent on B. This is the concentration of A, and this is the free molar free energy of A atoms. This is the concentration of B, and the molar free energy of B atoms. Okay. Now, this is a, a typical free energy curve as a function of composition. You've come across this before, haven't you? Yeah. When you were studying phase diagrams, you did free energy curves. I, I will tell you why it has this shape later on. And this is the free energy of pure A, and this is the free energy of pure B, the molar free energy terms. If I have a solution of that much B, then it has this free energy. That's straightforward, isn't it? Okay. Now let me show you what this equation looks like okay, on this graph. Okay, so that's straightforward. If I draw a tangent over here, then this is simply the weighted average of this term and this term. Okay, so we have separated out the effects, uh, the contributions from A atoms and B atoms to the total free energy. Yep, everyone happy with that? So this mu A is called the chemical potential of A. So if you've done some chemistry, you come across this term frequently. Mu A is the chemical potential of A, and mu B is the chemical potential of B. All it means is that it's the molar free energy of A atoms in a solution, and the molar free energy of B atoms in a particular solution. We've separated out the effects of A and B to the total free energy. Everyone happy with that? Now notice that mu A and mu B 
will change with concentration. Because if I have a concentration here, then this tangent becomes different, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so when I use, uh, when I use curly brackets, okay, that means it's a function. Okay, it's a function of x. It's not uh, multiplying. Okay, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So notice that these free energies will be dependent on concentration. So you have two terms in the diffusion coefficient. First, the CA, which determines concentration dependence, and then how mu varies with concentration that also gives you additional concentration dependence. OK, now this is the same graph. And I just want to show you how you get this particular form of curve for a mixture. Any ideas? Yeah, this is going back again to part 1a. Why is the curve this shape? You know, if I mix pure A and mix pure B, why don't I just get a straight line giving me the average free energy? That's correct. The, the first term that uh, gives you a, a shape, that means if I plot the free energy versus concentration, you know, and this is pure A and this is pure B, I can't simply assume that this is a mechanical mixture because when I mix them up, you're going to create AB bonds. Okay? So there's an enthalpy term which is when you break AA bonds, BB bonds, and create AB bonds, there will be a change in free energy. Any other term? Supposing, yeah? Entropy of mixing, you see? Uh, as soon as I add a single B atom or an A atom to pure B, I get a huge number of ways in which I can arrange that A atom, and therefore configurational entropy. And even if delta H is zero, you will always get a curve which looks like this because mixing is favored. Okay, by entropy. So this is the entropy term contribution to uh, the free energy, and that always favors mixing. Okay, because a random distribution is what is uh, most favored. Yeah, do you remember the form of this equation? It's not important. I'm just rem reminding you. Yeah, this is the configurational entropy of mixing term. And this is the enthalpy of mixing term, where you know, we must have the binding energies of A atoms, B atoms, and AB atoms. We break AA bonds, BB bonds, and form AB bonds. Right? Now, this term can alter the shape of that curve. Because if the enthalpy of mixing favors the formation of AB bonds, then you get a curve which looks like this. But if it opposes the formation of AB bonds, that means A atoms prefer to be next to A atoms and B atoms prefer to be next to B atoms, then you will get a more complicated shape like this. Yeah? Now, do you remember the common tangent construction? Yeah? So now we have two phases here. And in order to find the equilibrium compositions of those two phases, those two phases are in contact. Alpha and gamma are in contact. Okay? These are the equilibrium compositions of the two phases. And they, they are different, aren't they? The concentration of solute in alpha is less than the concentration of solute in gamma. They are in contact. But no matter how long I hold it at temperature, there will be absolutely no diffusion between those two phases. Yeah? That clearly goes against fixes law, right? It says that concentration gradients drive diffusion. The reason why we don't get any diffusion is if I extrapolate this line to this point, then the chemical, uh, the mu A in alpha will be exactly the same as mu A in gamma. Yeah? Because the intercept of 
this tangent which is common to these is the same for both curves. Right? So the free energy of air atoms in alpha is exactly the same as the free energy of air atoms in gamma. So there cannot be any diffusion. Yeah. If they share the same intercept on the vertical axis, then mu a alpha must equal mu a gamma, right? And that's the justification of the common tangent construction. So the general condition for equilibrium is that the free energy for each species must be identical in all phases that are in contact. Okay? And it's the free energy gradient which drives diffusion. And if there is no free energy gradient, yeah, because the free energy of air atoms in alpha is the same as that of uh, air atoms in gamma, then there is no diffusion. And this is the reason why, you know, when you see ice in seawater, you know, the ice is almost pure water, whereas the seawater is salty, and yet there is no diffusion between the two. They are actually in equilibrium. Yeah. So we're putting two different substances in contact, and yet, you know, most of the textbooks will tell you that Fix's first law applies, that diffusion happens down a concentration gradient. Okay. Right, so by having different kinds of AB bonds, we can actually generate free energy curves which have more complicated shapes. Okay. So th this is a case where the enthalpy of mixing is zero. So this is the ideal solution where the A atoms are indifferent to whether their neighbors are A atoms or B atoms. Okay. This is a, a case where there's a tendency for clustering. That means A atoms prefer to be next to A atoms and B atoms prefer to be next to B atoms. So we have a minimum here and a minimum here and a maximum here. Okay? Whereas here, the minimum occurs at 50-50 because mixing is favored. Okay? So this has important consequences on diffusion because if you look at the equation that I put up on the board, um, the, let me just, uh, yeah. The diffusion coefficient depends on how mu A changes with C A, okay? So if I go back to this graph, if I draw a tangent here, mu A is there. If I increase the concentration of A, then mu A increases. That means D mu A by the CA is positive, and the diffusion coefficient will always be positive for that kind of a solution. So for an ideal solution, where delta HM is zero, d mu A by dCA, that means the curvature of that plot, is always positive, okay? Positive, and therefore the diffusion coefficient is always positive. Similarly, if we have delta HM positive, uh, sorry, negative, so we still favor mixing, then d mu A by dCA is positive, and the diffusion coefficient will always be positive. Okay. However, here is a region where d mu A by dCA is negative. The curvature is such that the free energy of an air atom decreases as I increase the concentration. Okay? So if d mu A by dC A is negative, then we get the extraordinary result that the diffusion coefficient is negative, and we will get uphill diffusion. So this is called uphill diffusion. And it will happen in any system where there is a tendency for atoms to cluster. Okay. So just to illustrate this, first of all, I'm going to show you how atoms in a solution behave when we have an ideal solution. Okay. That means uh, when I break AA bonds, BB bonds, and create AB bonds, I don't get any change in enthalpy. Okay? So if I allow the atoms to move about, then 
the solution will remain random because in those circumstances, there's no tendency for clustering or for ordering. Ordering means there's a higher probability of AB bonds than AA and uh, uh, than a random solution. So you can see that no matter how long I allow the atoms to move about, you, it will remain a random mixture. Now I'm going to change the bond energies. Okay. And show you the case where the atoms prefer to be next to their own kind. Okay. So immediately the system starts to cluster and we've got uphill diffusion happening. We are developing regions which are rich in A or B. There is a, a technical term for this, which you might find in the books. It's known as spinodal decomposition, but that's just jargon. Okay? So here is a case where you get diffusion up a concentration gradient. It's a very important phenomenon in metallurgy because you can use this, exploit it to strengthen things. And of course, uh, it, it can also be detrimental because if this kind of a change happens while something is in service, it will alter the properties of the material. On the other hand, if I, uh, let me first of all randomize this again and show you the other case where we will get a tendency for ordering where the enthalpy of mixing favors AB bonds more than you would get in a random solution. So let's imagine that this is random. If I now change the bond energies, then you tend to get ordering. That means it's rare that you find two red atoms next to each other. They prefer to be next to the blue atoms. Okay? Now I could show you images in a field iron microscope which show all these three phenomena. So you can actually see the atoms doing exactly what I've shown you on the simulation. Incidentally, this simulation is being done with some software called Matter, which is accessible to you in all the computers in uh, the class laboratories. Okay? So there are, there are many aspects of diffusion, dislocations, everything which you can play about with. Do you have any questions? Is everybody clear about the concept of the free energy of an air atom in a solution? Could you point out which page it is? OK, let me just check. Mm -hmm. Delta HM corresponds to an ideal solution where the atoms of different species always tend to mix at random. It's always the case that d mu a by dc a is greater than zero. Oh, second. So when delta h m is less than zero, atoms prefer unlike neighbors. So let's let's just prove it. So we've got we've got a curve with two minima when delta h m is less than zero. Okay, so okay, so let's do that. So in that case, the curve will always look like this. Okay, and here we are plotting the concentration of B in that direction and the concentration of A in that direction. Okay, X and free energy. So supposing that I start with a small concentration of A, then this is mu A. Okay. If I now increase the concentration of A, then mu A increases. Okay. I think it's confusing because A increases in this direction. Yes. So d mu A by dc A is actually positive. So we've got time for any other questions? Yeah. 
Okay. I will check it out. Okay. I, I will check the notes carefully. And Right. Well, uh, yeah. You see, if I, if I do this, if I go to this one, OK? And again, we are plotting the concentration of A along this axis. Can you see it? Yeah. Of A. And concentration of B goes that way, OK? Then let's assume that we have here a low concentration of A. If I draw a tangent, in this region, that gives me mu A. If I now increase the concentration of A, um, sorry, if I now, this is a low concentration of A, and what I want, I haven't drawn the curvature sufficiently in this region, so I'll plot another point here. Okay. So by decreasing the concentration of A, I've increased mu A. So D mu A by DC A, is negative in this region. Yeah? So I've decreased the concentration of A, but increased its free energy. Yeah. Now, there will be a point of inflection somewhere here where the curvature changes, where d mu A by dc A will be 0. And diffusion will not happen. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.